Hello, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Thomas R. Porter from the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I will be discussing with you uh, the important topic of the safety and efficacy of the ultrasound enhancing agents. The objectives of this presentation will be to update uh, what we have on the safety of the ultrasound enhancing agents. Secondly, we will discuss with uh, not uncommon side effects and adverse reactions, as well as pretty rare uh, adverse uh, uh, reactions uh, and how to manage them. And finally, we will talk about the most common side effect, and that is not getting proper image enhancement uh, from the agent and how we introduce uh, very low mechanical index imaging to improve the quality of the image that you obtain. The three approved uh, ultrasound enhancing agents in the United States uh, are Lumison, uh, which is a sulfur hexafluoride uh, uh, gas uh, inside of a phospholipid shell, uh, Definity, which is a perflutrin or C3FA perfluoropropane uh, encapsulated in a phospholipid shell, and Optison, uh, which is also a perfluoropropane encapsulated uh, microbubble. Uh, that has an albumin-based uh, shell. The size of these agents are fairly similar. They're all much smaller uh, than red blood cells uh, in that they are at most 4.5 microns in terms of their distribution uh, with very, very few uh, uh, reaching that 10 micron size. Remember, uh, red blood cells are between 7 and 8 microns in size. In two October of 2007, the Food and Drug Administration issued a uh, three-part product labeling revision uh, for both Optison and Definity, uh, which had been approved, as you can see here, for several years prior to this a box warning, with Optison being approved in 1997 and Definity approved in 2001. The uh, box warning that was issued uh, by the Food and Drug Administration uh, was uh, issued largely uh, based on four patient deaths um, and 190 other serious cardiopulmonary reactions uh, that were temporally related but not caused or clearly caused by the ultrasound enhancing agent. This prompted the Food and Drug Administration uh, to I issue a mandatory physiologic monitoring period for 30 minutes after the uh, administration of the ultrasound enhancing agent uh, and included several warnings uh, with regard to uh, patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, or acute coronary syndromes or undergoing even stress echocardiography. Uh, this was particularly perplexing to uh, users who had been using it for stress echocardiography uh, quite uh, uh, frequently prior to this uh, box warning. And the whole uh, question of whether the enhancing agents were at all related to uh, the, uh, the deaths or the serious cardiopulmonary reactions that occurred uh, prompted the uh, investigators and users in the field to uh, perform several trials to document the safety of these agents, which we knew in advance, uh, but uh, because of some deficiencies in post-marketing surveillance, um, uh, were unaware of uh, to the FDA. And uh, as can be seen in this upcoming slide, this uh, prompted the investigators uh, and users from around the country to uh, record and collect the data of the patients that they had already done uh, contrast uh, administration to, uh, to further explore what the, the real concern was uh, and what the real side effect rate was for uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. And this slide depicts a uh, certain number of those agents that was published in the 2018 guidelines issued last year in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. That involves over 200,000 patients uh, who had received ultrasound enhancing agents in a wide variety of clinical situations, both outpatient and inpatient, as you can see here, uh, and uh, in settings of both stress and rest echocardiography. And 
in these patients, there was no evidence when compared to uh, a propensity matched a group of patients with respect to mortality or adverse serious adverse reactions. There were a rare occurrence of anaphylactoid reactions to the enhancing agents, but it was clear this was extremely low uh, in incidence and there was really no increase in mortality associated with the use of the ultrasound enhancing agent. Further studies were performed uh, and once this information was made known to the Food and Drug Administration, uh, other uh, interesting um, unexpected findings uh, were found with relation to the use of an ultrasound enhancing agent. Uh, this is some work that was published in the American uh, Journal of Cardiology in 2010. This would be three years after that box warning, uh, where uh, Kahawa uh, demonstrated there was an actual improvement in patient outcome, uh, especially in the inpatient setting, uh, with patients that had received ultrasound enhancing agents within the first 24 hours of their admission to the hospital, uh, when compared to a propensity matched group of patients that did not receive an ultrasound enhancing agent uh, with their echocardiogram. This actually raised the concern that not administering an ultrasound enhancing agent during a critical uh, echocardiogram may miss a diagnosis uh, or uh, be associated with a worse prognosis merely because of the delay uh, in getting the proper diagnosis if an ultrasound enhancing agent is not used. Uh, this was further examined by looking at the three different approved agents that I showed you on a previous slide, and a consistent finding, whether it included patients with stress echo or, or excluded patients with stress echo, was that there was a reduction in all-cause mortality in critically ill patients who had their echocardiogram performed the same day or the next day with an enhancing agent when compared to patients who had obtained echoes without an enhancing agent administered. Thus, there was a protective effect, again, that really one could assume was related to improved diagnostic capabilities and better patient management uh, when using an ultrasound enhancing agent. Secondly, they clearly showed, independent of the type of ultrasound enhancing agent used, that there was no increase uh, in mortality or a significant difference in adverse side effects associated with using ultrasound enhancing agent. Thus, demonstrating not only the safety of ultrasound enhancing agents for routine echocardiographic use, but also the potential uh, improved outcome with early administration of the agent uh, in diagnostic testing. These findings had important implications uh, in that it prompted just within one year of issuance of the black box warning, a class label changed by the Food and Drug Administration, which removed the October of 2007 indications uh, and any physiologic monitoring required for the use of an ultrasound enhancing agent, which was, uh, again, uh, very difficult to apply uh, because of the necessity of using agents in up to 30% of our patients. However, this label change did not address the uh, monitoring that was required for pulmonary hypertension or for unstable cardiopulmonary syndromes. So additional testing was done in these patient populations. And this was also published in our guidelines statement in the American Journal of American Society of Echocardiography uh, last year. In that, several studies were done with each of the approved agents uh, uh, that were available to us and uh, included some uh, use of Sonaview, which uh, although Lumison wasn't approved yet at that time, uh, we did have European data uh, with Sonaview. Uh, and looked at uh, difficult situations, namely pulmonary hypertension, uh, stress echocardiography, left ventricular assist device patients, ECMO patients, all of these uh, with uh, significant uh, morbidity and mortality uh, associated with just the kind of clinical state that patients were in, and included patients with right to left shots uh, that uh, also was listed as a contraindication. 
And as you can see in the outcomes, although there were some uh, uh, adverse events reported, none of them uh, were at any increased risk when compared to uh, patients receiving ultrasound without an enhancing agent. So the enhancing agent was proven to be safe in situations of pulmonary hypertension, uh, in LVAD patients, in patients on uh, uh, ECMO, uh, and in patients with uh, right-to-left shunts, most of which were patent for amen ovales. So this prompted additional um, um, rescinding of the uh, box warning. Uh, again, at this time, still applicable to just Definity and Optison, which were approved in this country. Uh, it, the monitoring for pulmonary hypertension was removed. Stress, uh, any contraindication to use during stress echocardiography was removed, uh, which, as I pointed out to you, uh, this was one of the main purposes of ultrasound enhancing agents. But the FDA now uh, became aware of the fact that not only were we using it uh, uh, as needed uh, frequently during stress echocardiography, uh, they removed any contraindication or, uh, or concern with regard to its use uh, during stress echocardiography. Uh, and other safety data, including uh, critical care setting uh, situations, any box warning or risk was removed uh, at that point. Now, there are other side effects, and as uh, sonographers uh, beginning in the field, uh, you want to be aware of, of what other potential minor uh, uh, or major side effects could occur, and how should uh, your lab be ready to deal with those issues. One of the issues that we've seen is back pain. Back pain is primarily a, uh, seen with the lipid encapsulated microbubbles, um, primarily with Definity. Uh, it seems to be a complement mediated a reaction uh, and results in uh, accumulation in the uh, kidney. Uh, and occasionally, uh, around one to 2% of the time, uh, you uh, may have a patient complain of back pain uh, with uh, the use of an ultrasound enhancing agent. In that setting, uh, although this uh, is not considered an anaphylactic reaction, uh, it is important to, at that point to discontinue the use uh, of the agent, uh, monitor the vital signs. Um, rarely analgesics are necessary because the, the symptoms usually uh, abate within uh, three to five minutes uh, of their appearance. And if you still need contrast, it's recommended in that setting um, that uh, one switch to an alternative agent uh, and with lower frequency of any back pain. Uh, and uh, that usually works pretty well. What we do in our lab is switch uh, from Definity to Optison in that particular setting. Now, this is more of a pseudo uh, concern, uh, but it's certainly bound to come up, uh, just like the issue of renal insufficiency. Some patients may refuse an ultrasound enhancing agent because um, it's referred to as contrast. Uh, and when patients hear contrast, they may say, oh, um, I have uh, kidney problems. I was told I shouldn't get contrast or that there'd be a risk for kidney failure should I receive contrast. Well, in that particular setting, uh, we can reassure them that the microbubbles have no effect on a kidney function. In that same context, you may uh, hear the patient may uh, learn from Lumison, for example, that there is sulfur hexafluoride is the gas inside of the microbubble. Uh, and they say, well, I have a sulfur allergy. Well, in that case, uh, you should be aware of the fact that the sulfur allergy is actually a sulfonamide-mediated allergy for the most part, uh, although it may pertain to sulfur dioxide. It certainly does not pertain uh, to uh, Lumison uh, or Sonovue in Europe uh, and other countries uh, in that that is a sulfur uh, gas and not a sulfonamide or a sulfite. Sulfonamides are typically in antibiotics or in diuretics like furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide uh, and uh, are not to be considered uh, uh, any in any way related to sulfur hexafluoride. Uh, and sulfur, as you know, the eighth most common element in the human body, uh, we uh, can handle very well. And there are no allergic reactions to sulfur hexafluoride that we know of. 
I mentioned previously about the concern with regard to a right to left shunt. Um, this uh, has been addressed finally uh, in the past couple of years, um, but I want you to think about this first, just in terms of how did this ever become a contraindication in the first place? The size, as I put, reported to you early of, earlier, of the microbubbles is between 1.1 and 4.5 microns. So these uh, are easily uh, pass and follow red blood cells around uh, and uh, serve as uh, intravascular tracers. There is an approved agent uh, that is actually indicated for evaluating right to left shunts. And it's called macroaggregated albumin, or MAA. Uh, it is between 10 and 150 microns. And so it's much bigger than red blood cells. Uh, and therefore could get trapped in arterioles. Uh, it, for some reason, had only a precaution labeling from the FDA, but up until 2017, uh, uh, the much smaller microbubbles were considered a contraindication and it had a box warning on them for anyone with right to left shunts. So this was somewhat perplexing, uh, uh, but this was addressed uh, and it was proven that in patients with patent for amenovales or small right to left shunts, uh, that ultrasound enhancing agents, as you might uh, suspect, uh, were shown to be very safe. So you do not need to be concerned about any right to left shunt before using an ultrasound enhancing agent. Now, I mentioned briefly that the, uh, there is this anaphylactoid reaction uh, that uh, has rarely been reported. Uh, with the ultrasound enhancing agents. The incidence seems to be somewhere between one in 5,000 and one in 10,000. When we say anaphylactoid, as I mentioned previously, this uh, means it is not IgE mediated like anaphylactic reactions are. Uh, and this type of anaphylactoid reaction uh, is complement mediated uh, and has been uh, observed with radiopaque contrast at a much higher uh, incidence, also seen with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, aspirin, uh, and uh, unlike an anaphylactic reaction, it, it doesn't require a prior sensitization. It can occur with the first time you administer uh, the agent. The reactions vary uh, in severity, uh, but are related to increased vascular permeability uh, vasodilation, uh, which can cause hypotension, uh, and bronchial, uh, bronchiolar, a uh, smooth muscle contraction. It is important uh, in the echo lab uh, to recognize this symptom because it's rare, uh, like I said, one in 10,000, um, and it will typically occur within 30 minutes of the last injection or infusion. Once one observes dyspnea or, or uh, hypotension, uh, it does require uh, epinephrine, and therefore uh, the lab should be ready uh, to administer epinephrine uh, for this rare event. Uh, remember, this is probably going to occur maybe once every three years or something in the echo lab if you use contrast routinely. We've only had one uh, that's really required uh, IV epinephrine. Uh, the other reactions have been more just in the line of some urticaria and pruritus. Uh, that resolves typically on its own with an antihistamine. But you should be aware and, and be ready uh, to administer either IM epinephrine in the thigh or a one milligram IV injection in patients that are uh, develop hypotension or respiratory insufficiency uh, and be ready to administer a good volume of fluid over a short period of time, uh, typically about a liter of saline over uh, 30 minutes uh, because of the vasodilation uh, and a need for intravascular repletion. Airway management may be necessary uh, if the patient has bronchospasm, uh, and antihistamines should be routinely administered because of the, it does play a role, histamines do play a role in this response. You should be aware, though, uh, that uh, the frequency of this is very low, um, uh, that an anaphylactoid reaction of any kind is around 1 in 15,000 with an ultrasound enhancing agent, uh, and a severe fatal allergic reaction would be about 1 in 500,000. If you compare that with other uh, like iodinated contrast agents, uh, where this reaction uh, of one is about 1 in 500 of some type of reaction and 1 in 5,000 of a potentially uh, 
life-threatening reaction. Uh, even uh, and think about it also in the perspective of what uh, other tests, uh, the risks, uh, your other tests that you routinely use, uh, put a patient through. A SPECT exam, just because of the radioisotope exposure, has about a one in ten thousand uh, or perhaps higher risk of eventually causing a malignancy later in life. Obviously, not an acute reaction, uh, but uh, it, it puts them at higher risk for that. An exercise stress test still has about a one in 2,500 chance of having causing a myocardial infarction or death. A dobutamine stress echo um, uh, has uh, a risk of causing ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation or a myocardial infarction in about one in 2,000 patients. And coronary angiography, uh, obviously not one of the quote unquote non-invasive tests, uh, but the risk of that, which is fairly routinely done as we all know, uh, has is about one in a thousand of causing death. But it is critical uh, that we have basic life support knowledge for all the sonographers uh, in the lab where ultrasound enhancing agents are being used uh, and that nurses and physicians be trained in administering epinephrine uh, and other advanced cardiac life support procedures. Well, let's go back to our timeline. After the 2011 and 2012 uh, removal of the monitoring for pulmonary hypertension and any uh, reference to it not being safe, ultrasound enhancing agents not being safe during stress echocardiography, more positive developments have occurred. In 2014, we all rejoiced when Lumison, our Sonoview and the multiple other countries uh, that it has been used in, uh, was approved in the United States. So we had a third ultrasound enhancing agent. This is the sulfur hexafluoride agent uh, that is not contraindicated in a sulfur allergy, just for review. And then because of the other uh, studies that uh, I showed you with, with regard to the safety of ultrasound enhancing agents in a right to left shunt uh, and the fact that they're probably much safer than the FDA approved macro aggregated albumin, the shunt indication was removed. And finally, this year, in 2019, um, the International Contrast Ultrasound Society, headed by the Feinstein family, has uh, issued and worked with several other uh, radiology and uh, cardiovascular groups uh, to uh, get a petition to the Food and Drug Administration to completely remove this box warning, which still exists for some reason, uh, with virtually no contraindications other than allergy to perflutrin uh, and this very rare risk of a serious anaphylactoid reaction. We're well aware of these potential complications or side effects. That should no longer need a box warning because now the ex um, amazing safety of these agents and their tremendous potential uh, is finally coming to light. And this brings me to the last point. The most common side effect I consider uh, with an ultrasound enhancing agent is not getting the proper image enhancement from the agent. In other words, you use it and you say, well, I didn't get what I wanted. I wanted a good opacification of the entire ventricle so I could see all 17 segments because this is what the FDA approved this agent for. Uh, and we're over 20 years since the first agent was approved. We need to do it right. Well, Almost for that same time period, the ability to do it right has been out there, but it's always been considered a perfusion imaging technique uh, when it actually uh, should have been considered an, an optimal left ventricular pacification technique all along. And what I'm referring to is the fundamental nonlinear imaging uh, modalities that uh, were actually here at, uh, way back in 2000. Uh, they're available in multiple systems, uh, all the commercially available systems. Uh, and they either are an amplitude uh, multipulse scheme uh, where alternating amplitude is uh, 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 um, the transmit function, uh, and this uh, results in a enhancement even at a very low mechanical index. And when I say very low mechanical index, I say I'm referring to a mechanical index less than 0.2. Uh, to, it's able to elicit, elicit a nonlinear response from the microbubble. Uh, and this can be either an alternating amplitude uh, uh, pulse sequence scheme 
or an alternating polarity and amplitude sequence scheme, um, which was available way back on the uh, Accuson Sequoia system, uh, which subsequently became Siemens uh, Accuson. Uh, and these uh, are what really turn out to have the best left ventricular opacification. However, uh, what most people, when they use an ultrasound enhancing agent, are still using is just the low mechanical index harmonic mode. Okay, let me explain the differences. This is a patient that has the typical bad window that we try to use with even our best ultrasound equipment. Uh, this is a patient on a ventilator uh, shortly after arriving to the hospital in the intensive care unit, apical four chamber window, uh, where we're using uh, har tissue harmonic imaging at a very high mechanical index of 1.4 uh, and just not seeing the endocardial border. Now, as I said, the majority of the country still uses a uh, low mechanical index, something like around 0.22, as you can see here, around 0.3. Uh, and still in a harmonic mode, transmitting, as you can see here, uh, at about 1.8 and receiving at about 3.6 megahertz. Well, if you give the ultrasound enhancing agent at this mechanical index, um, you get a harmonic response from the microbubbles, very little response from the tissue. But since it's very high frequency response, it's twice the transmit frequency, the far field is very attenuated. So you have trouble seeing and, 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 and confidently reporting on the basal segments. What does the very low mechanical index imaging approach do? As we said, here we turn the mechanical index down even more to less than 0.2. But instead of capturing this funda uh, capturing fundamental, uh, excuse me, harmonic uh, activity, like you can see here, which is what our harmonic settings do, the, uh, the fundamental response is captured with nonlinear fundamental imaging, our very low mechanical index imaging. And what that does is that at this very low mechanical index, while the harmonic response is getting less and less and less, as you can see here, we get a much bigger response in the fundamental frequency. So that even very low mechanical indices, we're getting a robust response from the microbubbles, much more than the harmonic responses in a nonlinear uh, uh, imaging modality. But it's at the fundamental frequency. Now, that's very important because not only do we get enhanced contrast then, because this uh, multi-pulse uh, sequence scheme uh, produces an enhanced response from the microbubbles, but now it's coming back. We're imaging at that same frequency we were transmitting, which is 1.8 megahertz. What that means is this. By switching a button here in this patient on a ventilator, we go from a nice apically enhanced image to a nice apical mid and basal segment enhanced imaging here. Uh, when imaging now, look at, we turn the mechanical index down to 0.18 but we're transmitting and receiving at the same frequency. And so we don't have this attenuation in the far field. A dramatic difference in terms of our confidence in looking at the basal segments. And so when you have difficult windows like this patient here, referred for stress echocardiography, you can go to the fundamental nonlinear uh, response uh, and get much better resolution uh, and detection of wall thickening abnormalities, uh, not only in the apical segments, like you see with harmonic imaging, but now in the basal segments because of the reduced attenuation uh, with fundamental nonlinear imaging. And this is why our guidelines that I've reported to you previously uh, with regard to safety have also emphasized uh, that the ultrasound enhancing agents should be used whenever adequate segmental visualization in any coronary artery territory cannot be achieved with unenhanced echo. And that very low mechanical index imaging be the preferred imaging mode for left ventricular opacification and the analysis of regional wall motion. That is the key point. Uh, so that you won't have the most common side effect of being disappointed with what you're seeing. Unfortunately, despite uh, all these developments and publication of safety data, 
we still are way underutilizing ultrasound enhancing agents. Our lab has to use contrast, we believe, in at least 30% of our inpatients and outpatients in order to optimally detect regional wall motion and uh, assess a, a left ventricular ejection fraction in a quantitative sense uh, for serial evaluations. Uh, and this is particularly important in uh, cancer chemotherapy uh, and decision-making with regard to implantable uh, uh, defibrillators. But as you can see on this 2014 uh, data chart uh, that Mike Main shared with me uh, from Kansas City, there are many states, including very big states, that contrast utilization is less than 2%. That clearly doesn't mean they have that much better windows than we do. It just means that we're not using it uh, appropriately uh, and that we really need to uh, uh, address this issue uh, because of the potential importance and patient outcome uh, that is associated with early administration of ultrasound enhancing agents. So to conclude, ultrasound enhancing agents remain underutilized. They are safe in critical care settings, and that uh, we have now pretty much eliminated any potential uh, situation where in a critical care setting you could not use an ultrasound enhancing agent. It is extremely helpful. We just did a case in a patient on ECMO uh, where they were uh, thinking about not going back uh, to the operating room uh, to remove a hematoma purely because they thought there was a thrombus in the left ventricular cavity. We gave contrast to the patient on ECMO, completely ruled out a thrombus, and they went right away to surgery. This is safe in critical care settings and provides vital information uh, that we should be using, especially if we use the fundamental nonlinear imaging approach. It is safe in pulmonary hypertension. It is safe in right-to-left shunt. There is a rare anaphylactoid reaction that you should be uh, uh, familiar with advanced cardiac life support uh, with your nursing and physicians uh, should that a rare event occur. And clearly, if you, you, you can work with the ultrasound manufacturer, whether it be GE or Canon or Philips or Siemens, uh, work with them. Uh, to uh, obtain their fundamental nonlinear imaging modality, which they do have. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to discuss safety of ultrasound enhancing agents. Thank you.